All right. So um, as with the first cohort and um, and 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 the book, our goal, yeah, it's it's chapter seven. The sequence of topics is is uh, uh, very logical. They build on one another very nicely. Um, so they, they move beyond our ordinary least squares modeling from a couple chapters ago. Um, and and we'll, we'll step through polynomial steps, uh, different forms of splines, localized regression, and then GAMPs. And really our, our destination is, is the most generalized uh, form of, of, uh, of multivariate modeling. Uh, some resources I found useful, just to give credit because I, I didn't invent this stuff, of course, the text. Um, cohort one has two videos. Um, I watched them at one and a half speed. <laughs> uh, the the uh, One of the authors of the text has his own, say, lecture videos and his own lecture slides. Uh, Emil, of course, has a few tidy models examples in this world, and we'll talk about some of the limitations there. And then there's a uh, author, Kim Larson at Stitch Fix, um, actually has an excellent article um, about the silver bullet, um, actually praises GAMS for, for some reasons, and, and we'll talk a little bit about why um, you know, our destination is so valuable here. Um, okay, so that's that's this hour, I hope, and uh, I hope it fits in the hour. <laughs> um, all right, so we'll dive right in, and I think I have to make this bigger. Um, okay, I hope the text is big enough to to read and to uh, you can along. you can click the the a there on top and uh, it fix it to a uh, bigger size. Yeah <laughs> uh, even if there you go when you turn the page. Yeah fantastic. Okay. So we'll start with um, really the simplest concepts and um, uh, Obviously, for for most data sets, for for most behavioral activities, uh, the, the 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 truth of the data sets we're working with is is really never linear. Um, we'd like them to become linear to to take advantage of some of the benefits of of inference. Um, so, in in most of these cases, we're we're, we're trying to uh, create a function such that these coefficients on the uh, dependent variable or independent variables have some relationship or contribution of to the uh, dependent variable. And the first one we start with is a polynomial expansion. Um, in this case, written as a, a, a degree D polynomial, could, could be third degree, fourth degree, fifth degree. Um, that, that expansion has a, has a coefficient for that um, uh, specific independent variable to, uh, to a certain power. Um, I have the tidy models code here, but let me scroll down to a, a graphic because these, these plots uh, are, are useful illustrations of what's going on. Um, in this case, from the book, um, the wage data set from ISLR2 um, has uh, a number of uh, uh, um, say uh, in individual uh, wage figures as a dependent variable and just one variable age and, and obviously this scattering of points um, that there are people that are the same age. <laughs> um, so drawing a line by itself is, is, uh, is, is complicated. Um, but what they've shown here is that for regression um, in, a, in a fourth degree polynomial, it's possible to fit uh, 
what looks like a, a curved line with curved confidence bounds for regression. It's also possible uh, to, to use the polynomial regression to fit for a classifier, in this case, uh, either wage over 250 or wage under 250 given a certain age. Um, some of the, say, details or comments. Um, so what we've done is essentially created all new variables. Um, so in this case, the age variable has an x1 component that it is itself, an x2 that is age, but it's age squared, et cetera. And it treats the problem then after the transformation like a multiple linear regression, even though um, everyone is, is just age. Under the hood, the expansion happens with the R poly function. Um, but this is a little bit um, not intuitive. And, and I want to show an illustration um, in this data set. Just look at the, the head of the data set where age is 18. It's saying age to the first power is this, age to the second power is 0.056, and age to the third power is 0.072, which doesn't make sense. You would think age to the first power is 18. Um, what R does, and really what the best practice is, is actually to force an orthogonal expansion of these powers. So there's no correlations in the new variables. So it's it's not quite what you expect. The, the way poly works in, in the way that's intuitive would be to add this raw equals true, and then, then you see the raw polynomial expansions. But so raw is not what's happening in polynomial regression. It's, it's actually the former, that, that these um, um, essentially rotated or, or you know, the orthogonal expansions. So these exponents or the sum of them do yield 18, but they're deliberately uh, uh, made so that they do not correlate with one another, which is really a nice feature. At the end of the day, um, the authors say we're not interested in the individual coefficients, um, you know, the B1, B2, B3, that, that, that is, we're, we're really interested in a, a good fitted function at any X naught. So you see, you know, the individual age data points, um, this, this would yield, um, age's contribution on wage, but, but the betas themselves aren't all that interesting. Since the new function is linear, we can get a simple expression for, for the pointwise variances or those, those um, intervals at hey, any Jim. value x naught. Oh, go ahead, Jen. Um, do you mind expanding a little bit? And I'm just a little bit, I, I'm really glad you brought up the fact that the polynomials aren't just raising the value to the power, but um, yeah. how, what do you mean by orthogonal expansion a little bit more? And if that's beyond the scope, that's fine. I can, I can follow up later, but. Um, well, I think of it as the way a PCA, um, you, know, you know, a principal component analysis um, in, in vector space um, arrives at components that are not correlated with one another. Mm. Um, so it, it is true, I, I guess you have to take my word for it here, that the, the mm. sum of, of um, you know, 18 to this power and 18 uh, or this, uh, how was that? I, I proved it to myself. Um, you know what might be better? In the poly documentation in R, uh -huh. um, they do speak to this, that, that this, that how out. this orthogonal expansion works. Maybe, maybe it's best to go to the, the documentation for poly. 
Me too. Thank you for letting me. This was that was a really helpful nugget. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Good. Good question. All right. Um, so we can get variances for any value of of h, um, and and I like that feature a lot um, because there there are um, uh, with this say cloud of data this uh, mass of data, there, there, there are obviously high wage um, uh, people, you know, independent of age. So there's something else going on. And, and the confidence we have in the age contribution varies across age. It's not the same band. And in fact, at the high end, uh, where there are fewer data points, we're less confident in the age contribution to wage. Um, okay, so um, one of the maybe disadvantages of the polynomial approach is um, you could pick D as some reasonably low value, either two or three, and in some fields, that's just what people do is, is uh, they, they, uh, they use a cubic or, or a squared expansion, or else um, there's a way to use cross-validation to look at two different values of D and, and get the better um, AIC value. Um, you mentioned logistic regression, you know, both linear and, and the, the GLM form of this um, uh, work. And the, they, they can be interpreted in largely the same way. Um, the authors note in their video that for the uh, logistic regression for the classifier, that the upper and lower bounds have to be calculated on the logic scale and then um, you know, unlogged to, to get put on the, the probability scale. Um, we'll see later. So, so we've applied this to just one variable. Um, which is interesting, but most often you have many variables and many expansions to do and even interactions. So uh, GAMS gives us the, the, the generalized version of this that we'll see at the end of the chapter. And then the last warning, which uh, for, for me would really take me out of using the polynomial version is, is the behavior at the low or the high extreme where the confidence interval is so wide that we wouldn't want to use these for extrapolation. We want to be very careful to only make statements about, uh, you know, inferences on future predictions in, in the middle of the range. Okay, so that was polynomials. I, I had included I, I rewrote uh, um, what the authors had done in uh, essentially base R. I rewrote it in uh, in tidy models. Um, it's so this will be available for for you all to run if you'd like to get to get the identical graphs using um, really Emil's uh, um, code to to make these charts. Okay, moving forward. All right, so polynomials apply across the width of the data set. And um, for uh, uh, the best smooth fit, that's, that's not always uh, appropriate. I think we saw with, uh, for example, with, uh, well, I don't know, with, with COVID data sets or, or other types of data sets where we're, the, the behavior across the time series or across uh, maybe population demographics is, is really not the same for every uh, subgroup. And so um, really um, modeling on step functions or treating segments of the population uh, differently is, is also a useful technique. In this example, um, they're cutting a continuous variable, um, again, age, 
um, arbitrarily into distinct reason, uh, regions. And uh, so here, just arbitrarily, if you knew something about age and 30 years and 50 years and 70 years being significant, um, you could build a model. And, uh, I have to look at the graphic here. Somewhat arbitrarily, you could build a model that has a, <laughs> a, a, a linear, um, in this case, a flat fit at different ages. And, and this, this is a useful approach if you wanted to contrast uh, different segments of age you know, in a regression or you know, in this case as, as, a, as a classifier. It's, it's, it's possible to do this. Um, very easy to work with steps. But again, if you if you wanted to tell it where the breaks are, it's it's just like creating dummy variables representing each group. It's also a useful way of forcing interactions that uh, are easy to interpret. Um, so so is there a difference in the interaction for people over seventy than uh, people under thirty, for example? But the specific choice of cut points or or knots that we'll talk about in a minute, um, you know, unless you've got some outside domain knowledge that says those cut points are significant, imposing that on the data or or forcing those cut points can be problematic. You know, you you're creating a a a, a break in the model that looks to be significant that may not be. Um, so that's what will take us into splines in a moment. But um, these, these concepts are still powerful um, um, in, in terms of interpretability. The stepwise um, um, procedure also can be applied to piecing together polynomials as we did before. So instead of a single polynomial X over the whole domain, as we did before um, in tidy models or some preprocessor, you can also force uh, the polynomial expansion over individual cut regions. Um, uh, so, so what's been done here in in tidy models is that's not so hard with the breaks, the, the, the splines can be added after this on, on the individual dummy variables, which I haven't done, but it's, it's possible. I've added a note here, the authors really um, encourage us to look ahead. There's, there's some discussion about continuity, um, either, either like a first order continuity where um, the, the steps from one group to another are um, at, at the same level of wage or, or outcome variable. And then there's uh, another level of continuity that's, think of it as second degree continuous or curvature continuous, where the, where the, where the curvature uh, flows uh, smoothly. And that's, that's a nice segue into splines, our next chapter, where um, we have the advantage of uh, a, a, a degree of like polynomial expansions. We also have the advantage of many nats. And, and by imposing this curvature continuous um, um, requirement, we, we yield um, uh, a family of, of uh, tools called splines. Any questions on polynomials or step functions? This is pretty fast. Okay, we're moving on to the good stuff. All right, we'll make this different. Okay, so splines. Um, they see here that uh, a linear spline is simply a piecewise linear polynomial 
forced to be continuous at each knot. So there, there are these basis functions between the knots that define uh, not only the distance between each knot, but, but that the end of the function be curvature continuous with the end of the next. Uh, fortunately, we don't have to really write the code for that. There are uh, basis spline functions and natural spline functions we'll see in a moment. Um, fact, here we go. Um, here's a comparison, uh, a, a basis spline. Uh, essentially, you tell uh, the algorithm that you want three knots and where you want them. Um, there's this concept of a natural spline next, which um, rather than telling it where you want the breaks, you tell it what say, degree of freedom you'll allow, and that uh, imposes a smoothness to the spline, but it selects where the knots will be then to, to yield the, 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 the smooth fit. So we've got, a, in this case, a, a, a red, yep, a red natural spline NS and a black uh, three knot cubic spline. And they're very similar, but, but not exactly the same. So yeah, with, with uh, uh, Oh, one other note here. So you you might have region, reason to locate your knots at cordial breaks or at range boundaries. That that's 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 okay. Um, but a lot of practitioners go straight to natural cubic splines. Um, it 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 actually because it's choosing where the knots are. It it ends up having fewer degrees of freedom. Um, so it's often a simpler, smoother, more generalizable function with, with uh, say less bias when, when you look at future data. data. So um, for natural cubic splines, the, the uh, code under the hood is this uh, smooth spline. And uh, it actually allows you either to uh, specify this, um, uh, I think that's a gamma, is that correct? A lambda. It's a lambda, perfect. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> so, um, so you could specify a lambda or um, you could specify the degree freedom. And um, it, either way, the smooth spline handles you know, saying it one or one way or the other. Um, the smooth spline function under the hood has a built-in cross-validation function. Um, also, so if, if you do not specify degrees of freedom, it, it will come back with one for you. Um, it, it, it brings it back as either, um, you know, a, a leave one out cross-validation or uh, a generalized cross-validation. Um, there's a warning that pops up. In fact, we'll see the warning in a moment. Um, if, if the data set and our data set with wage has duplicated points, we have many people with the same age, um, the, the generalized cross-validation works best with a lot of duplicates. And if you specify uh, true, if you force it to use uh, leave one out, it, it'll give you a warning that that's, that's problematic. Uh, in fact, right here, warning in spruce lines, um, non-unique X values seems doubtful. <laughs> um, so that, that happened because I, I, I forced it, instead of using 16, I, I forced it to use the leave one out cross validation it's, it's interesting in the graph, when I used the leave one out, it arrived at a DF of 6.8. And you know, otherwise the, the self-imposed one was 16. 
And uh, uh, as is intuitive, the, the spline with 6.8 degrees of freedom is a bit smoother. And, and maybe you can see how the, the, uh, the red line, the one that was told 16 degrees of freedom, it squiggles a little bit more. Okay, and then one other say, section before we get to GAMS, there's this concept of local regression. And I, I didn't include the really fancy plots, but uh, essentially um, this means of creating a, uh, it's, it's not exactly a spline, but it's a, a nonlinear fit that involves computing the fit at each target point using only the nearby observations. Uh, and uh, the way this is calculated resembles some of the things we do with uh, uh, nearest neighbor. So the algorithm walks from point to point, uh, age to age across uh, all of the ages and, and, and yields a a regression slope at each point as it traverses the, the domain. Um, local regression in um, under the hood is called, uh, in Iowa, this, this word was called lush. I don't know, in, in math, is this pronounced as lush or lois? Either way. We'll, we'll call it lush, I guess, just because I'm accustomed to that. But the lush fit yields a walk with, with a span, which is like the, a, a nearest neighbor's parameter. And uh, here again, a, a span like, like we saw with splines, a span of 0.2 with you know, only the, the, the points very, very close to one another it yields more of a squiggly line, a span of 0.5 that has a, you know, many more nearest neighbors in its range yield a, a, a smoother slope. And it's possible for a modeler to um, take the outcomes of those and, and compare, um, you know, uh, uh, RMSE or, or uh, um, you know, other, other uh, you know, errors to, to choose the best fit on unseen data. Um, so, so far, every example we've seen is, you know, age against wage. It's one independent variable and one dependent variable. Um, there's, there's a lot more utility that comes when these techniques are generalized broadly for many independent variables. And, and the authors of the book Incidentally, uh, two of them back in the 1980s uh, did their uh, like their PhD work on um, GAMS on different approaches to GAMS. It's, so it's interesting that it ends up in this book. Uh, just a side note: um, just plain ggplot. Uh, when we do a GM smooth on on group of points, I think when it's less than a thousand points. Uh, GM smooth uses the, the, the lush fit. And, and of course you can choose spans much like we did up above. I, I picked a different data set in ISLR2. The, this is runs and batters. It's a baseball data set. And here again, we can compare. Um, this is just with GM smooth um, using 0 0.2, 0 0.5, and 0.8 um, uh, smoothing. Okay, so I guess your destination is GAMS. We'll move one over there. All right, so generalized additive models. So Hasty and Tip Shirani, way back in 1986, uh, worked um, 
uh, did, did some very detailed paper papers on, we call it the frequentist side of extending conventional multiple linear regression um, and uh, mathematically the GAM like, like the techniques before uh, seeks to uh, make it possible so you can add the contributions of many independent variables to, to be able to break out you know, how does age com contribute? How does education contribute? How can, how does, so how does each feature contribute to the outcome? And the, and the sum of all of them or the sum of the nonlinear components with the linear components is, uh, is allowable. So this is way oversimplified, but, um, they're saying for this dependent variable, there's this expected value of the dependent variable and a, and a link function. It could be logit function or, or other links, uh, but that equals the sum of each of the input functions. Um, and the, the S here is a, the, your choice of smoother. And you can choose to use uh, natural splines uh, or, or polynomials or a number of other uh, inputs as you had in earlier parts of the chapter. Um, those input terms denote, um, in many cases, smooth non-parametric functions um, because there are uh, knots or because you're using uh, the, the lush point-to-point-to-point uh, -point -point regression uh, that they're not exactly parametric. But in the context of regression models, um, the, the sum of each of these contributes to the dependent variable. The, the goal is to allow for very flexible estimation of uh, predictive patterns without knowing up front what the patterns look like. Uh, there are two packages that embody this work. One is a GAM package that um, um, Hasty and Tip um, have been uh, a big part of for a long time, but a more recent package, the the Bayesian approach is the MGCV package. And it turns out in GeomSmooth, if you have more than a thousand points, um, rather than using a lush smoothing curve, what you get is a, a MGCV GAM version of the uh, GeomSmooth curve. All right, so let's look at what happens when we model uh, a GAM with wage as the outcome of uh, a, a, a spline in four degrees, age in five degrees, education as a categorical for, for that wage data set. Um, it's interesting to me if we if we ask for a, say a summary of that model, it, it does give us parameter estimates. And uh, for frequentist significance, if if you're if you're doing a quick take on uh, whether that um, feature what was significant. Um, and, and because it's a GAM, they actually do approximate significance of the, of, of the, of all the elements of the spline together. So, so you get a, a, a P value for the smooth term. All right. So the plot GAM or that GAM model does something interesting. It 
it actually makes what amounts to a facet plot that shows the, the contribution of each of the independent variables uh, to, the, to the dependent variable, which is, which is kind of nice. Um, we'll make a comparable model here, just built with LM, uh, with the linear regression, uh, with natural splines. Um, this, 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 is, this is similar in that um, plot gam will also plot that so, so this, um, and this is in the frequentist side, but the, 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 the plot gam plot function from gam is smart enough to break out the, the, the spline contributions uh, in the same way that the, the, um, the MGCV gam did. So we see similar graphs, they're, they're not shaded, but, but they yield uh, about the same sort of functions. Um, so why use GAMs? Um, these, these techniques are, are really useful because they retain um, strong interpretability. We can explain the contributions of each um, independent variable for, for inference. It, they're very highly flexible yet. And, and because we can um, do some amount of feature engineering or feature selection, uh, it's helpful with regularization. Uh, for example, the polynomial expansion uh, automatically um, you know, made orthogonal contributions to minimize correlation. So there's there's, there's, there's useful aspects of applying GAMs. Um, so when the model contains nonlinear effects, um, um, GAMs provide something that other methods, uh, you know, often would be missing one of these, these other three features. GAMs strike a nice balance. Um, and they're extremely flexible in ways that the like the black box algorithms aren't. Um, recall though that the coefficients of like the individual polynomial expansions aren't interesting. It's it's the sum of the whole smooth that's interesting and the fitted functions. It's possible to mix terms to do um, linear or nonlinear, you can force that, uh, almost like mixed effects even with the categoricals. You can use smoothing splines and local regression. So NS and Lush in, in the same algorithm, you can choose that. And even um, interactions. So you can technically in here uh, force interactions if, if there's something for example, if you believe at different education levels, the contribution of age is, is different. Um, some comments in R, the two main packages are GAM and MCV. Um, the MGCV, um, Simon Woods package is somewhat newer. Um, <laughs> There are a lot of namespace conflicts between the two. Don't try to use them both. Um, in, in many ways, um, the Bayesian one is, is a bit more uh, generalizable because it considers any GAM to be uh, penalized. Um, and Simon's documentation and MGCV is, is very good about the differences. Um, I struggled trying to go back and forth between them, you really can't have them both loaded at the same time. You have to restart R uh, to, to use them. Um, tidy models, there, there is a um, tidy models engine for creating a GAM. It is MGCV specifically. Um, yeah, note on restarting R, here's a classification model. Nice summary. Okay, here again. So, so even the classification models can speak to 
the contribution of each variable. And I, I think I had left year. Yeah, I, I had just left year without a spline. So this is just linear, a spline of age and the categorical education and, and got this sort of model. I'll pause there for questions, I guess. Um, done a lot of talking. Okay, this is a uh, Jim, uh, There's question. some chat here. Uh, uh, Jim, question. Have, have you used uh, a GAM models, you know, in in any uh, business or real world situation? Mm. Yeah. yeah um, um, I can I think, think back, back to a few cases where um, in, an, in an engineering conversation, in a physics conversation, okay. um, we, we had used uh, some expansions, but, but um, I, I had a, 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 a client or an engineer that really was looking to prove a, like a bearing life expectation. He, he expected mm -hmm. some sort of polynomial relationship between um, the, the life of a component and the, the pressure on the part, for example. Right. Uh, um, but, but no, not on, not on <laughs> transactional data or financial. Um, so many other people just go straight to XGBoost thinking it's the best. Right. Right, because I, I, I've seen, you know, this model, I've seen more in the academic, uh, you know, setting, the academic, academic fields in terms of, you know, trying to uh, prove, you know, that their thesis and all that, and they, you know, use uh, generalized additive models, GAMS, and Bayesian models and all that, and you know, that, 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 that's perfect. But I haven't seen that much, you know, so far, I haven't seen that much applications in business settings, okay? I, um, yeah, I'll acknowledge what you're saying. Usually the first question from a client is they want to predict the future. Right. And, um, and we do that. Um, but um, the discipline process, uh, feature engineering, EDA, often takes us to a little different place where we want to explain how the data yields this prediction. And um, I, I don't know that I use GAM so much, but GlimNet, the regularized regression. Correct. I, yeah. I, uh, I, I like to throw my models through GlimNet before anything else, um, just so I understand what's showing up as significant. Right. And I suppose whether it's through GlimNet or, or through this, um, we can have a conversation about model interpretability and the contributions of each, you know, right. um, uh, input. I, I, yeah, I, I have seen uh, in a GLMs, you know, generalized linear models. I have seen it as a baseline, for example, in classification, uh, you know, settings. Usually a GLM gives you a baseline of, you know, where your data, uh, you know, is, it is relationship, in regard to the class, okay? But then you go on to other models and other, you know, other, other strategies. And, and I've seen that, okay? Especially when you're classifying, uh, you know, uh, good credit, bad credit, okay? Um, you know, uh, defaults, loan defaults, I've seen uh, GLMs, but rarely I've seen GAMs, uh, you know, used in that way. And maybe, um, I mean, I'm, I'm speculating, but maybe uh, it has to do with the interpretability of the coefficients, because, you know, as you mentioned, the coefficients is not where the, the explainability is in these models. It's more the fitted, 
you know, how, how, it, how, how it predicts, you know, regarding the, the whole combination of, uh, of, of model, linear and, and nonlinear. Uh, because in the other models, you can do some, you know, variable importance, you, know, you can do other things that really gives you a, a good picture of what is moving your, you know, your predictions, right? You know, depending on your, on your, on your targets. Uh, but, but, it's, but it's interesting. I remember, uh, you know, when I was studying the, the regression, uh, uh, usually you uh, can, can use splines, for example, to model a, a sinoid, you know, wave, okay, like a wavelength. You can use splines for that, okay? I mean, you can use other things, but you can use splines and it's kind of, you know, uh, simple uh, to, you know, to model and to, and to grasp. Yeah, one of the things I took away from this, or I learned, mm -hmm. uh, the the concept that you could get a point-wise um, confidence um, interval or credible yeah. interval, that that I guess could be powerful too. Um, you know, to be able to speak about where in the region we've got a lot of confidence and and where we have less and and. Um, the black box methods. Uh, I mean, there's there's Lyme and other things, but but they don't quite convey, you know, uh, 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 the pointwise credibility. Uh, I, I think right. not as well as this does. So I I, I learned that that is uh, uh, could be powerful. I, uh, the Poisson point or even survival models, that's another aspect. Um, so, so these methods are definitely compatible with, with Poisson, with counts and money, and, and um, they're very relevant with survival. And, and if I get back into um, like those in engineering contexts, um, absolutely, I, I definitely use that for survival. Yeah. yeah. Other questions? It's, you know, I, I, I didn't go into the homework. Um, cohort one talked about one of the homework problems. And I started on it and it was really hard. <laughs> so I, I could work on it for another week if you like. Um, or we could move right into trees. Um, either way, I guess, where should we go next? I'm good for you know uh, uh, starting decision trees. Uh, I I you know did the the statement the, the last time you know we were we, we met that uh, that's a long chapter okay chapter eight because it's not only decision trees that we're talking about it's about mm -hmm. random forest uh, extreme boosting SG boost and Bayesian okay and the Bayesian. Uh, I mean, it, it, it's, it's blank, <laughs> it's, it's blank. We can talk about it, we can talk about it, but I, I don't think we're going to be, you know, uh, we're going to get a, a, a lot of it because you, you have to really set a foundation for what is base, okay? And you have to go through all that, you know, uh, history before getting to that. But those three, those three uh, topics is basically, you know, each, each of them, you know, could cover an hour, <laughs> okay? So uh, one of the things that I was, you know, I was suggesting is that uh, we can talk a little bit about the theory of the decision trees, right? Uh, because it's important, you know, to know more or less, you know, what, what, is, what is happening, you know, inside uh, those models. Uh, talk about the visualization. And then, you know, that will be like an hour. Then on the other hour, we can talk about the random forest and the string boosting and leave the Bayesian for, you know, another day. Yeah, uh, yeah, uh, yeah. I I agree. I absolutely agree with this. Uh, just uh, the this week is uh, Jim, but next you you Jim have one more week if you want, one more session if you want to take it. Yeah, it's it's up to the group. How do we do we do we? Uh, so we we could do another week on games on the, on the problems. Um, yeah, or, that, or we could dive into the trees. That would be would be interesting, uh, as the same I've seen they do in the statistical rethinking. 
uh, book club, we can split the, uh, the lab within uh, each of us. So like oh, one okay. each or oh, a part of sure. the Yeah, that and present. Yeah, I present like 15 minutes each uh, something um, in practical using R for this chapter. And then, uh, so Ricardo is, is you uh, within two weeks, isn't it? Could do that too. Uh, yeah. how, how should we split the problems then? What, yeah. what do you recommend? I don't, I don't hear very well, so. <laughs> Line um, uh, how are we going to split the, you know, the, the problems? My, <laughs> my line is, uh, but anyway, um, so, yeah, okay. So let's, let's talk on Slack. And uh, thank you very much, Jim, for this session. And Excellent. we'll uh, see each other next week. Okay. Okay. Bye. All right. Yeah, take care, everybody. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Thank you.